Thank you, everybody. Uh, sorry about starting uh, one minute late. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm JPS Kohli. I'm the uh, CEO for uh, Scale-Up Group. There are two parts of a company, Scale-Up Technologies, which is the consulting services, um, and Scale-Up Online, uh, which is a platform for future skills and human skills. So a little bit about myself. I have about 25 years of learning industry experience. Half of that has been in the enterprise space, uh, working for Microsoft, for example, as a director for the worldwide uh, courseware development. That was one big role I played um, for all of their commercial training. And then last couple of years, I moved into a product management role, uh, transforming the online training. In fact, I brought Microsoft to edX and launched uh, six of the first few programs that Microsoft launched on the edX platform in 2013 or 14, I'm kind of losing track of time there. But um, uh, so having done that, and prior to that, the other half of my experience has been in uh, uh, building services and learning uh, content services businesses. Uh, first, before the enterprise experience with Microsoft, and second time with Scale-Up Technologies. And it's just been an exciting ride. Uh, my quest is uh, to actually equip young minds and professionals with uh, skills that they need to really thrive in this rapidly evolving technological world. So, and that's what I set up Scale Up with as a transformational learning organization uh, to help close the skills gap uh, with a technically innovative and human-centered approach or you know, embedding soft skills very core to the technical skills uh, to have much more successful outcomes in the workplace or for a new student entering into a career. Uh, and that's what organizations are looking for, that's what university and education system is looking for, and that's what individuals are looking for, whether they are in a working professional or they are a, a new entrant. We have offices in uh, US, headquartered in US, in Seattle area, uh, with offices in India and Portugal. And some of the work I'll just display this not, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here, but just giving a high level overview. We have recently done 5,000 hours of content development, uh, about 220 plus employees, in about 40 cities worldwide, and that's just the nature of times. It is a pandemic that exasperated that, but also prior to that. So we're very comfortable working in a distributed world, uh, about half a million enrolled users, bunch of courses that we've done for universities worldwide, and a high course completion rate. Uh, but just as a quick uh, audience poll, how many, what do you think is the industry average for MOOCs or online courses? for course completions? Any number, ranges? Five, yeah. Five, 15, anything, you know, you could pick, take a pick, but typically five to 8% and slowly going up, that's the whole endeavor. How do we kind of engage the learner more? We've achieved a very significant, with some key programs that we've done for workforce development around artificial intelligence and we achieved 67% course completion rate. And part of that is really focusing on the learner and the outcomes. And this discussion is a bit about that and how we end up achieving that. Uh, so we are an end-to-end -end solutions provider. We work with content strategy and content uh, development as a big area, but also enabling platforms. What we're realizing that many organizations, universities, they've invested in uh, existing infrastructure, LMS, and technology, and they want to move it, and they don't know whether they move it to a new, uh, new LMS, new tool, new platform. So we help extend. We can still, and I think a lot of you guys are doing that as well. How do you implement open edX solution integrated with LTI, with an existing LMS, whether it's Canvas or Cornerstone, so we do all of that as well. And then we help run the service. We have a teaching assistant as a service program, learning support services that we run out of India. We've been running that for close to six years. And the next talk, lightning talk, uh, Ratan, uh, who's the CEO for Scale Up Online part of the business. The platform has a talk on the learning support services. So with that, I'll start with the, uh, the set the stage on just evolution of online learning. This is not a full, uh, this is my take on how I view it. There is a sage on the stage uh, phase of just education and learning, uh, which is driven by the guru, the master or the yoda whatever you may call it, right? It is one-on-one. -on -one. It's, you know, early times saying, learn from me. And then it went to private tutoring. So medieval times, you started having wealthy people who, who had access uh, 
to riches or wealth or power, so you had private tutoring. And then it moved to mass education, and that's kind of stayed on for centuries. Mass education may have moved, you may have, you know, education was this method earlier and it evolved, and, but it was largely about process structure. We'll tell you how we will impart learning to you. And then you come last few years, which, where it has got on a hyper phase in few years with the arrival of technology, uh, with AI, with internet, uh, you, st you had the power of the individual. So from the sage, it moved to individual. There's a pendulum swing that went to e-learning. And now everybody started saying, well, e-learning is going to solve the you know, world hunger or everything about education. Uh, and because it is anytime, anywhere, and the power is to an individual, we are giving everything to the individual, and they will figure it out. Right? That's highly learner-centric, if you call. But it didn't work, because only 5 to 6% of users will go in. If you give them access to unlimited content, they're only the highly motivated ones that will go in and learn on their own. Others need nudging, support, peers, parents, a human infrastructure, and that's why we call our soft skills as well, uh, you know, we call them as human skills. So they need all that. And so then MOOCs happened. We said, okay, now let's do this at massive scale, uh, you know, free, so maybe the, it'll kind of solve the problem. And we start innovating with additional support services, and that also didn't solve the problem, and now the world has moved more to a being hyper-personalized. So what was the Sage on the Sage stage? took centuries, everybody's got habituated to that model, uh, it's ingrained in us, it's ordered, structured, uh, it's very safe, predictable, we are very used to it. It's, it's how we operate, at least definitely my generation, not my kids. Uh, and on the other side, you have very learner-centric. Uh, Anand talked about it in his talk uh, yesterday as well. It is new, unknown, highly personalized. What does it do for me? It's unpredictable. And it is hyper. It is like few years it has taken to just get to this stage. So then we said, okay, what is transformational learning when Skillup set up as a transformational learning organization? Initially, we, th we also took the, uh, you know, the first uh, phase, uh, the sage phase, to say we will, this is our take. Here is our process of doing transformation, because we are adding online support, we are adding one-on-one -on -one mentoring, we are adding virtual sessions. That's what transformational learning is. But off late, we've moved that. We've said transformational for whom? It is transformational for the learner. So can the learner transform themselves into a better skilled person with the way they prefer to learn? And so it's highly customizable. Should it be highly customizable? And we feel yes. Uh, and learner is at the center of stage. And then it needs to have more high, high tech and high touch, uh, because that's how people learn. They learn with people and they learn on their own, but there's no one size fits all. It's highly fragmented. Uh, so, but then should it target to learner needs? What does my individual learner want? And can it offer choices? Because it's so fragmented, can I give a different pathway to a particular group or a learner who prefer it on self-paced, who learn between 12 a.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, in the night on video-based learning. But that doesn't work for somebody else who likes reading, who likes processing, who wants to do some more hands-on exercises. And another person who says, well, I don't even look at all of that. I just want experiential. I just want somebody to tell me, show me, and somebody that I can talk to. So it's all different. I'm trying to do a course and get outcomes ready. So if I give them a single process that this is the only way, we, research has shown us X, Y, Z, uh, that doesn't work for those other now 60 to 70 percent because there's no single uh, predominant learning style. And then we feel it should be very outcome driven um, and focus on what are the skills and competencies that the learner is wanting to build. And then also experiential. We feel that is, although we're saying there's no one size fits all, but by and large, the more experiential it is, the learner, the retention, uh, the, uh, the learning and the outcomes, the skills and competencies gained is much higher. So let's talk about learning trends. 
And then again, I'm not giving a lot of data because I think this group has a lot of the data at their end, but just setting the stage on what are the things we are looking at so that I can show you some of the experiments we have done. And uh, there are, so these kind of become problems, or we can look at some of these as opportunities. Uh, so, and Anand talked about, I actually picked the first uh, bullet from there, that industries are becoming more consumer-centric. You having the example of LinkedIn and Amazon, where you have one a retail business uh, going and becoming more on-demand industry, again, very customer-centric, and the other one into a streaming service from uh, entertainment industry going there. And learning, similarly, is becoming very learner-centric. How does it work for me? So, and on the other hand, you have this unbelievable amounts of data that you can process with today's technology and access that is in public domain and uh, do some things with it at Fingertrip. Uh, your own courses that you run on Open edX, you can have data available. You still need to process, uh, analyze it, and understand it on how does, uh, you know, what places do more learners gravitate to? Which video parts are working better? Are the labs being visited more? Why? And those questions. But you need to ask those questions and process that and then say, how do I reimagine the way I uh, distribute or the way I deliver my training experience? So that's the another uh, trend uh, or opportunity that exists. And then technologies are disrupting everything. So the AI, ML, uh, data science, that uh, you know, uh, in industrial revolution or the fourth industrial revolution is just changing the things very rapidly. A lot of innovation is happening in this space and saying, how do we go and understand that data? And then metaverse as a, uh, as a domain has also come in. Many of us feel when I've talked about augmented reality and virtual reality on courses, uh, recently doing a course for, uh, you know, we do work for Microsoft, IBM, SAP, and the likes, and this comes up, is it too gimmicky, or is it something real in it? And we were asking that question as well, saying how gimmicky it is, but when I watch my son play in the metaverse, he doesn't feel it's gimmicky. It is, you know, uh, so I just suddenly feel it's a generational gap. But then I see that's the way they are growing, but there's probably more to it. It's still uh, augmented reality, something that I'm used to. So I, I do have a specific demo around that on uh, the metaverse side and augmented reality. And we've, we are kind of experimenting in how that experience is going to be working for learners. So that's one specific thing I'll talk about. But as a technology area, that's intersecting very well with the learner-centric trend that we are seeing. Uh, and then one very interesting... Uh, thing uh, is future of work is intersecting with future of learning. This was a, uh, I gave a talk a uh, couple of months back at future of learning here in Portugal itself. And I stayed in a um, co-working, co-living space, Selena. I don't know how many of you are aware of Selena as a brand. It was fabulous. I thought I'll be a misfit, We're used to staying in hotels. And you know, you have this younger generation, digital nomads working there. And I met in three to four days people from 12 to 15 different nationalities. It was community, you know, I was working there at, at the restaurants, there were events that were organized. I was obviously hiring too. I was trying to see if I can get some uh, technical folks as we have set up office here. But uh, these stories uh, were, one, two or three that I remember, a person, a Belgian national, she was uh, working in Spain and then chose to work out of Portugal for four months. An uh, Ireland person who moved here, uh, university education and instructional designer, wanted to learn newer ways, but chose to come here and work out of here. And I was asking them questions, okay, how is your organization paying you? I said, well, there are the challenges, so our HR is going through these discussions and stuff. So that's the future of work. There's no single style as we're coming out of the pandemic. The other report, uh, there was uh, Sarah from Copenhagen. She consults on culture, cultural shifts, and future of work. So she gave a talk in the, uh, the school living space, and she was talking about a data point, saying there's no single preferred uh, you know, work approach post-pandemic, saying, I only want to work home, or most of the people are saying, I want to work home, or most of the folks are saying, I want to work out of office. That's changing. It's all distributed. And that's what's happening in learning, too. Everything is frag fragmented. Uh, your learning styles, your preferences, on how you want things is all distributed in small chunks. So how do we as building, as, as uh, learning design consultants or content developers or instructional designers 
make sure. Yeah, so how do we make sure that we meet the learner expectations in this world is a huge challenge. And then there's this opportunity, some of the numbers that we've seen is uh, being talked about in this conference as well, that employers expect to offer reskilling and upskilling to over 70% of their employees by 2025. Again, the way technological changes are impacting the workforce. Uh, and then over 100 million workers, one in 16, will need to find a different occupation by 2030, post-COVID. So again, um, all of this is intersecting together for us to say, how do we create a personalized, compelling, and effective online learning programs? And so that's the question that we keep asking and saying, what are the key elements? And obviously, there are many, uh, you know, around three key pivots that I see. Uh, one is, what's the platform choice and what features does it offer, whether it's open edX, Canvas, you know, take or pick, uh, Coursera, and how are they evolving their platforms? Then what's the content innovation? How can I make my videos more engaging? Can there be interaction within videos? Can there be, uh, there is, uh, which is Anoto, they have an interesting video solution that says, uh, you know, you can embed uh, social dialogue within a video. So the, all of that, which is at the content space uh, that we can do. And then finally, what learning support that we can provide. But then here are a few things that I felt uh, I need to put and talk about is how do we build a solid instructional design and pedagogy in this context? It's still valid, but now the context has changed. Where things are more learner-centric, how do I make sure that my instructional design methodology takes into account that I'm to, going to cater to many learners and thereby invest upfront on what my course design needs to look like. The tools are a means to an end, but how do you use those tools to try and have an effective learning program? So that's very important. And then within this, trying to have a, a good experiential learning, for us it was very important. So how do I combine a project-based learning approach with competency-based learning? Uh, you know, how do I add those up? And that's for us becomes experiential learning. So that's something that we are trying to do in the courses that we offer or the courses that we consult with. Uh, and then how do we offer personalized paths? I talked about this uh, in the beginning. So we are thinking about not necessarily, we may stitch a preferred path, but we are thinking about offering and some uh, MVPs we are driving where we offer students different pathways, saying you could, if, you, if video works for you, you could just take this on-demand pathway for the same content. And if, if uh, you know, instructor or one-on-one -on -one mentoring or one-to-many mentoring works for you, take that pathway. Uh, and if, you know, more hands-on or lab material works for you, then we'll give you more of that. And of course, how do we add pricing and commercial engagement or business model to match that while the learner is choosing those pieces? So how do we build all of those components and add that? So that's a space we are uh, trying to uh, spend some time on as well. Uh, obviously using technology to understand learners, using data, uh, enabling learner communities. We've also seen that they, learners are starting to, uh, that's the swing back from, that's the balance I feel from very instructor-led training that the pendulum swung to e-learning and self-paced learning. That's kind of bringing it back more to the center, saying how do you learn from others, how do you learn in communities, and how can we experiment and emulate the real world through metaverse. So that's one example that Mark is going to show as a demo uh, in, in this session. And then how do we custom provide custom learning support, which is both tech-enabled, so think about chatbots. So we, we did a, a session a couple of days back on how we use chatbots in our course and then how that dovetails into a discussion board or forum that is more human-led. So how do you combine a human and technology? So those are some of the themes that we are looking at to make sure that learning is more transformative or uh, transformational. And um, while Mark will show a demo on the metaverse, I will talk about another example uh, where we focused heavily on the instructional design and pedagogy and kind of combined some of these elements. We did a Microsoft professional certificate program on data science for Bellevue College continuing education uh, student base. We uh, partnered with Bellevue College to put together an instructional design frame framework, the 12-week program, uh, and the students, they were students, the learners were a mix of uh, students, early in career, and working professionals, and it was a continuing education class. 
we absolutely implemented the flipped learning model so they could go into uh, our open edX version which was integrated through LTI and single sign-on with Bellevue's uh, uh, campus uh, so that the student didn't have had a very similar experience when they registered for the course uh, and they got this user ID they were automatically taken to, on a single sign-on to the on-demand version and they uh, watched the video lectures there but the labs and exercises were done in the class uh, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, and there were three to four hours, and the instructors facilitated that. They paired up a working professional or stronger student with much more weaker to do the lab exercises. And then the students, we kind of formed a, uh, a practice where the instructor would say every other week, uh, two or three students or groups will get a chance to talk about how what challenges are they facing, and they had to present back to the class. I did this lab, I wasn't able to complete it, what did you and there was a dialogue around that so again kind of trying to emulate a workforce environment or workplace environment when they go for their jobs they're presenting to uh, their peers or they're presenting to stakeholders oh, sorry so um, so that happened and then um, there was a capstone project project uh, that they had to finish between 12th and 14th week and that was significant amount of work. They had to bring all of the stuff that they learned and the labs they did and apply it in a capstone and submit a report. But in the eighth week, the students had to come and read about the capstone prior to coming to presenting and talk about their approach. They said, we've already done these labs. This is my approach to the capstone. I'm picking up this project. And if they needed mentors help, they took that and then they delivered that. But the focus was more on presentation. Think about what your audience is. You can imagine it's your manager. You can imagine this. So we gave them uh, typical scenarios. Uh, and then they did that. And then finally, when they completed it, we had the employability and career element. So we called the Microsoft team. Uh, they came and presented on how they can set up their LinkedIn profile if they had not already set it up. And, they, and also, how can they set up an Upwork profile? And participate in the gig economy because some of many of them were looking for jobs so we said well while you apply for the jobs you can go and take some project work assignments through Upwork and see if you can even the way you did your lab assignments if you can pair up and try and take, pick up a project and see if you can earn money we didn't follow up on that thread whether any of them did it but the satisfaction levels went through the roof we had 95 percent course completions almost everybody and the capstone was tough and ev almost everybody completed the course, and the satisfaction was amazing. So they were saying, well, this is something which is very outcome-driven. I felt I not only learned, but I was also thinking about how am I going to apply it, and things like that. So that kind of gives you an idea of how we applied some of these elements, and, but we are really talking about look, picking up a course and thinking uh, very heavily on how, what approach do we take. So the next... Uh, Next piece that we're going to talk about is the demo. So in this case, we picked up a course which we were running, or we are running in a, on death by Zoom, as <laughs> Anand called it, <laughs> to say, or we've actually tried Zoom, Teams, and WebEx, all three, but it's a live virtual instructor-led build your personal brand. It's a soft skills course. Students have to show up, and they have exercise and stuff to do. And it's a perfect course that we want to experiment if we move that class to, uh, well, right on time. <laughs> if you move that class to a metaverse environment, what would the experience be? And we'd really try to emulate, instead of giving them instructions on how they work with the Zoom interface, how do they work in a breakout room, and everybody, each one of us struggle. Well, this is a new, I'm trying to learn this, and now you're trying to teach me how I operate a WebEx or a Teams or a Zoom platform. Uh, of course, the Metaverse is also a new platform, but once I'm operating within that, we'll show you how the students are navigating the class. So I'll hand it over to Mark to come and show us the demo. Thank you. So I, I, was the, um, I was the very fortunate um, recipient of Skill Up Services. The program was so successful, we actually spun it off to a second program. And the first class had we had I, we had 25 students in that class, and I think 23 of them completed. 
and they walked away. For those of you in higher ed, you'll know the difference between a certificate and a certification, and they walked away with certification from Microsoft. So that was a really big deal for us. So <clears throat> the, the whole concept, yeah, yeah, give it up. the whole concept of, of exploring the metaverse for um, our, our uh, synchronous interactions came about because our instructor was incredibly frustrated with the uh, several of the uh, programs, Teams, Zoom, WebEx, and trying to get the students into those breakout rooms, get them separated. He had a lot of drop-offs. And so I decided to do a little bit of my own research. So I went out on a number of, of, uh, of discussion boards out there. And lo and behold, I found we were not alone. <laughs> Um, and I can't repeat some of the things that they said on these discussion boards about the, the frustration that they had. So I, I had come across, and I actually ended up Forrest Gumping into um, finding out about this one particular company called Verbella. And they have this program, which was a metaverse program. And I began to take a look at it because we knew the features we wanted our students to use, right? I said, we've got to have features in this metaverse universe out there that everybody's comfortable with. Whiteboards, uh, being able to display your a website, being able to display a PowerPoint presentation and do that simply and easily. So how do we do that? And when we began using Verbella, the other piece that I chose, the reason I chose it was because, again, it was simple. There was a little file to download. Oh my gosh, people complained about that. And we said, oh, well, do you use, do you use Zoom? Do you use WebEx? Do you have to download an app? Oh, yeah, yeah, you do. So this was no different. You set up your avatar. We send out information to all our students ahead of time. We tell them at least three times prior to the start of their first synchronous sessions, did you download it? Did you set it up? And did you create your avatar? and we give them a private suite. We have our own private suite. We can have private suites for each of our classes. He's, he's already taken me out of the metaverse. <clears throat> and, and just to let anybody know, I don't know if anybody out there likes to if you geek out and have Oculus and the goggle things, you know. And uh, of course, I don't have any of those, even though I did take a wonderful tour of Lisbon uh, on my Oculus before I came. Um, you can actually use Oculus with it, but I don't think anybody has done that. So, again, from a learner's perspective, they come in, and as you can see, there's a reception area. We have a, we'll have a, uh, a TA or a mentor or somebody who will be a receptionist for the students coming in, saying hello, like to see you. Hey, Mark, how, you, how are you? Hey, how are you, uh, Roth? And he goes, hey, just head on over to the boardroom because that's where the class is going to start. So the student just simply scales around and begins to start walking. But he notices something. He says, what's all that blue stuff? See the blue stuff around that? That's an amazing thing, because if I walk in to the blue area, you hear a little ding, that's a private area. So if I'm having a conversation in this area, nobody else that's outside of that private area can hear our conversation. Don't know about you, if you've ever been in a conference situation, right? You got noises coming from this workshop, you got noises coming from this workshop, you don't have that here. These are private. So they go, okay, I got distracted. I a little bit of attention deficit disorder. So I'm gonna head on into the boardroom, two parts to the boardroom. And as you can see, I can actually have another conference area here if I would like to have uh, people sit down. It's also blue. But I'm gonna go ahead and walk on in. And now I'm in my main room and we tell the students just come on in and have a seat so they sit down now they're sitting down in the room they press their space bar and now they can look around so the instructors in the front of the room giving instructions each of these things along the side are pull down screens anybody ever seen that before have you ever gone into a presentation where they had screens where they press the button and the screen comes down Press the button again and the screen goes up. That's what they have here. <laughs> it's, it's weird, isn't it? And <laughs> I know. So what makes it exciting, what makes it a challenge for a lot of people is because they hear, well, this is like, this isn't real. This is a metaverse, right? It's got to be different. Why? It's not. It's the same metaphors. 
So if, if the, an instructor wanted to, he could certainly walk on over and if the screen is distracting, there you go. Now the screen's not distracting anymore. Yeah, I know. No, 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 no. I want to show it. So, okay. All the while, again, the students can have a seat. They can sit down. Their name is over their heads. So the instructor can see who's in the classroom. And if you need to, you just simply go, oh, I got a question. I think I got it right. There it is. I have to be careful. I don't have my glasses on, so if I pick the wrong thing, I'm in trouble. Because I can dance in here, too, if I want. So. Now, you don't want to see me dance, trust me. <laughs> so you can see all of me. I can sit there, and so if somebody has a question in the classroom as an instructor, I'm standing up here. Each of you have a little name that's over your head. You have, I ask a question, a little hand pops up, so I can say, hey, you got a question? What's your question? And then you talk. You get, give me your question. Everybody in the classroom can hear. How different is this? than a team meeting or a Zoom. Is this death by teams? It's a little bit better. And the other reason we went this approach is because we create what we call, um, it, one of the issues that we have, it's passive learning. When you're sitting there in front of a Zoom screen, it's very passive. So we want students to be actively engaged in a learning process. And yes, certainly you're sitting here and you're listening to somebody talk, blah, blah, blah. This particular course, which is about building your personal brands, is very interactive. So from this perspective, students can be actively engaged. They can ask questions. They can turn around and talk to somebody else in the class, et cetera. But now I'm reached a point as an instructor, and I'm saying, OK, gang, I'm going to give you about three minutes. I need you to head to the room. And by the way, let's just. We'll just pop this open so now everybody in the room can see this bright and clear. And so here we oh, I'm in room one. Okay. I'm heading over to room one. Sounds good. So I'm going to, I'm going to mess up the whole presentation, which is really good because I have a TA in the room with me, and the TA is going to help me out. <laughs> As I turn around, by the way, the little pictures you see on the wall can all be branded for whatever you would like. If it's your course, if it's your company, if it's your school, you can brand that as well. So I'm headed out. Oop, don't worry. It's really, it's really nice, too, because if you've been out the night before or something and you're having some trouble that morning, you, can, you, know, you happen to walk into a wall, it doesn't hurt. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to go into the wrong. So these are all breakout rooms, as you can see. So this is building your personal brand. I, I didn't want to go to breakout room one. I'm going to go to breakout room two because I'm going to be a troublemaker. And once I go into breakout room two, you'll notice there is some blue around the edge. We hear the bing bing, and I'm in a private room. So I can set up individual small groups. They can come into the room. We can set this up. We have a TA in oftentimes or somebody else who has maybe taken the class or somebody who's more advanced in the class or whatever it may be, but they can act as a facilitator, which is generally selected by the instructor ahead of time. And then we can go ahead and this person can have a seat. And we sit down and now we can look around the room, right? And the nice, interesting piece of this is that if I click And I'm going to do a presentation. If you look down here at the bottom, this up here allows me to do a number of things. If I wanted to, I could do a live video. I can also download and bring in anything off my computer, such as a PowerPoint presentation. Oh, that's kind of cool. Oh, that's just what we did here. OK, so it's not different yet, is it? So again, you can bring up any website, you can bring up a document on your computer, you can bring up any, and it's so unique. You, no one's ever, ever done that before. I just look to see if I <laughs> picked up on that. It is pretty much the same that you're trying to do in the real world. So their mission on this is, it's a really key component as well. It's why I picked this particular program because of the feature set that it had. 
we took a look at it and we said, look, I don't know, I, and I don't know about you guys, but how many of y'all have ever done, you know, you get around, you get all these new technologies and you start playing around with it and you go, oh, this is cool. And you go, eh, eh not really. <laughs> Right? So what do you do when the novelty wears off? That's the bottom line. And in this case, when the novelty wears off, it's still dead useful because we've told the students, you have a code to get into this suite. You can come in anytime during the class, during when classes, you know, the two or three weeks this class runs, come on in at any time you want. You want to schedule some of your friends to come in and have a conversation? Come on in. It's okay. You can do that. So you can go and have your conversations. You can come out of these rooms and if you'd like, you can even go out, uh, go out of, the, uh, of the room. You can head over and they have computer terminals for you. And just as, as he heads over, you can actually schedule lab. So you can set up one of the rooms as a lab workshop room. So the instructor could say, you know, anytime you can, so instead of going through a discussion board forum, ask your TAs for support, your room TAs for support, or you ping your peers, uh, learners, and ask them, saying, hey, I really want to work on this lab. Uh, can we head over to the lab room? And that's a dedicated space to go and practice lab. Uh, so your uh, Jupyter notebooks or any of those could be set up there, and, and you could just uh, practice the lab. So now, here's your own personal workstation. It's kind of like, you know, you, and again, this is an unusual thing where they actually had computers set up for people to use. Um, but you have this. And it's also, if you noticed, did you hear the ding? It's private. So if you want to watch, nobody can see it either. So if you want to watch your cat videos, when you really should be building your Jupyter notebooks, knock your socks <laughs> off. And you go to the in the now, you know, that I, I had that exact question. Of the uh, of the folks at uh, of Verbella, and uh, they're working on it. They actually said yes. We really wanted to see if people could join the metaverse in our metaverse and then go out to its separate metaverse. <laughs> and I, I thought I started I started going down that rabbit hole, and I went eh, no, no. Now I'm getting <laughs> well, into it. Now you're they're watching it. Matrix Revolution series yeah. <laughs> just to pick up yeah. some ideas. <laughs> now I'm starting to get into a whole Doctor Who thing, so I, I'm not going down that that route. So the bottom line for us is it's new, it is new, and uh, initial feedback from some of our testers has been really enthusiastic. They're like, oh my God, this is so much easier. But it's also a way we want students to download, get into Verbella, walk around, be in part of the Verbella campus, et cetera, and walk around and enjoy and get used to the concept of how do you walk around, how do you use your arrow keys, how do you sit down, that kind of stuff. It's so much easier if you do that prior to getting into the class. Will students wait to the very last minute to try it? And yes, they probably, and then oh, I don't know what to do. I can't help that. But you get the idea. So we, we've, we've tried to preset this up and we've offered an environment which we think, and we're pretty, pretty sure that um, the effectiveness will carry on past the novelty of it. Yeah, I got my, yeah so we, we are still, practicing we are, we are trying to have one of our classes this is this is actually the class that is uh, we're taking from the regular session into this class it's taking place on may 10th uh, uh, so if you want to sign up uh, for open edX group we will we are offering a 50 percent discount it's anyway not too uh, too costly uh, on may 10th and uh, there are students signed up uh, you can experience and then we'll get we'll start looking at data on how that class was versus others. We haven't changed all our classes, but we're trying to really see, experiment, understand how they experience it, and then uh, see if we want to apply it to more. But we thought it was more applicable where it was a virtual class, a live instructor-led, and not so much a technical course with labs and uh, you know our, our data science foundation or any other course. And if it works here, then we'll try a few more classes like that. So. Um, that's it from our end, but we're uh, we're happy to take up any questions, any thoughts. No, uh, that's what we are doing uh, on on May tenth. Our UX team is involved in that as well. 
and we are taking uh, the data and we are taking uh, user testing at that stage and asking how that experience was. But we haven't, I don't know whether we've done a formal usability testing in that May 10th, but we are seeking more data. Uh, but right. our UX team is involved. I'm going to do so. Okay, yeah. and uh, just this follow up, sorry, will it be moderated or unmoderated? Moderated. Okay. Yeah. We'll have an, an actual instructor. But he won't look. He won't look like our instructor. He'll be a little avatar. I actually look better in the avatar than I do in real life. So. Yeah, you guys here. The, the intent, yeah, the intent is do, uh, to do that. So our product team is engaged. That's why we are doing it in a very small scale, this program. We have data on this running in a regular class. We want to compare it with how, we, uh, how this class is experienced. And if people like it, we'll try and run both batches and kind of do a, a ANB testing as well. So uh, we are putting those plans in place. But we are really in, let's try this out. Let's at least get anecdotal feedback. And if it works, we'll repeat it. And, and then uh, we'll done, do some formal testing on that as well. We're, and, and we're actually out of time, but the, the, the whole point of this is that it, it, you have to make, it, with any new technology, and this is particularly true of this, you have to make it an integral part of your curriculum. It's not a thing that sits out there that, well, I could use this and it's really cool and it'll add something. No, and in this case, it's an integral part. It is the content. It's an integral. So from that perspective, we're giving an opportunity to create much more diverse, I think rich opportunities for learning communities, especially, it's especially valuable in the technology areas where people really do utilize. And I mean, I've been, in, I've been doing this, I think, for 35 years in, in online learning. What we found in those technology areas is that people really like to have, because. I can't get my instructor at one in the morning, but you know what? My roommate or whatever is in that same class and we get together and so that learning community begins to grow and it helps and sometimes, I don't know about you, I sometimes learn far more from my fellow students than I ever did from my instructor. Yeah. No offense to the instructors. And, and then we have the breakout room as a very specific feedback we've got in the regular class that is just a struggle so we are waiting for at least that data to say, well, was it easier? Because you were already in the metaverse. They might, we might get feedback saying setting that up and getting this is a new experience. We, we think we might get that. But uh, the breakout room will give a little bit of uh, experience. And once I'm in and I'm already navigating, my breakout experience was better. Yes, we had one. Is it an open source? Uh, the question is, is it an open source uh, solution, at least the Verbella? Um, no. Yes and no. Yes, it's open source, and you're welcome to use the Verbella campus. The private suites are just that. So that's a, that's a pay for uh, use. So it would be nice. I wish it was free. <laughs> it's free, but I don't, I don't think it's open source. It's yeah. a proprietary uh, technology, but it's for the basic version of the campus, you can use it for free. It's third party, we still integrated it into a course. Earlier we would give a Zoom link and a scheduled class that students had to go to or a Teams link. Uh, and in this case, we are simply saying install the app and now 
this is the schedule, you gotta go to a class here, but because the campus is still available, you could hop in and do your work, project work. Uh, we will try out that, you know, if we set up some project assignments in the lab room, and that students can just go and some of that pre-setup is already there, so that we'll try out, it's not probably available for this course, uh, but the lab discussion and student discussions is something that we, we expect to repeat in this one. Have we had time? Okay, thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you here.